Okay, we're recording, so welcome back everybody. It's the 13th week of class. We're actually getting pretty close to the end now. And so I thought I would start off by just talking about what the end game is going to be uh, for this class. In particular, the last test and the final exam. Okay, so you've already taken two tests. You should be pretty used to the format and how things go by now. But uh, let me just run through real quick how the, the last test, test number three, and the final exam are going to go. So first of all, test number three, that's going to be given in lecture on Tuesday, May 3rd. That's kind of a ways off. I think that's three weeks from today. Uh, but I thought I'd just tell uh, you guys about this in advance. So here's what's going to be on that third test. You'll have between five and six questions, just like before. What's going to be covered is chapter 13. That's the chapter on gravity, which we're doing right now. And then also chapter nine, which we're gonna do next. Chapter nine covers momentum. All right, so just a test on gravity and momentum. That's gonna be the third test. And then after that, we pretty much just have one week of class left. And my plan is not to try to give you any new content during that last week. Instead, the last week will just be a recap slash review of everything that we covered, okay? So that when you take the final exam, this is going to be cumulative. Basically, everything we cover throughout the entire semester is fair game for the final exam. And the final exam is a bit longer. So just so you know, we're scheduled to take the final exam on Tuesday, May 17th. And our time slot is actually 5 to 7.30 p.m. So just take note of that. We start lecture at 5.30 but for the final exam, our time slot that we've been given starts at five, okay? And you have that two and a half hour block to take it. So because you have this extra time, uh, it's gonna be a bit longer, so you can spe expect between like eight and 10 questions, okay? Um, all right, for test three, you'll get to use a cheat sheet as you normally do. That's a half sheet of paper with whatever you want written on it. For the final, you can use a full sheet of paper filled out in the front and back, because of course there's more to put there for the final exam. All right? So that's how things are gonna go for test three and the final. Any questions on that? Go ahead. Um, would our final lab be the week prior to the final? Yeah, that's okay. right. So, um, so during that week, we're gonna just do a review. Um, so, both for uh, test three and the final exam, there's gonna be a review packet, which we'll go over the week before. That, that's also gonna be the same as usual, okay? Anything else? Okay, so I guess the other thing to mention here is the next homework assignment, homework 13, that's gonna be due next Tuesday. It's up there on the board. There's a worksheet that goes with it, so make sure you get this worksheet. Homework 12 is not due today. That's due on Thursday because I want you to see what we do in lecture today before you turn in that assignment, okay? So, we good? Good to go? All right. So, let me just remind you of what we did up until this point. We learned about something called the law of universal gravitation, which basically allows you to calculate the force of gravity between two masses. M1 and M2 is usually how we write these two masses in our equation. And strictly speaking, when you use that formula, it applies to what we call point masses. So the assumption is like the masses in question are just little points with no size. But of course, in real life, when we're dealing with actual physical objects, they're not just points. They have some kind of extent to them, right? I might be interested in the force of gravity exerted by the Earth or the Sun or an asteroid, things like that. Those are obviously not just points, okay? So in general, what you have to do to calculate the total force of gravity exerted by an object is to perform an integral. Basically what you do is you break that object up into a bunch of tiny little points and you add up the total effect of all of those little points. We're not going to do that in this class, all right? because not everyone has uh, gotten this far in calculus at this point, but that's generally how this is done. Fortunately, there is a really useful result, which I'm gonna tell you about here, that works for spherical objects, okay? Spherical objects. And by the way, 
This is useful because most uh, really large celestial bodies, like planets, stars, and things of that nature, are spherical, right? Or at least approximately spherical. Okay, so this is a very useful result that we can apply to anything that basically has a spherical shape to it. Okay? So here's how it goes. The force of gravity from a spherically symmetric object is basically the same as if all of the mass were contained right at the center. Okay? So what you should be imagining is this, right? We have some kind of spherical object. You can imagine this is maybe a planet. And then we have uh, capital M as the label we give to that mass, all right? And then we have some other object which we label as lowercase m. So this kind of notation is going to come into play. Big M is the dominant large mass, and little m is some smaller mass. You might imagine this is like a satellite going around the planet, something like that. So the point here is we can treat this spherical object as if all of the mass is just right there in the middle. For the purposes of calculating the force of gravity, we can treat it as if all of the mass is right there at the center. And that means when we calculate the force of gravity, we can just use that same formula from before. But this is how it will look like. We have capital G, capital M, lowercase m, those are the two different masses, divided by r squared. But remember, the effect of this is that we can treat this object as if all of the mass is at the center. So the r value should be the distance between this mass over here and the center of our spherical object. Right? So for example, I'm standing on the surface of the Earth, which is approximately spherical. If I wanted to use this formula to calculate the force, I would be calculating with the distance r being to the center of the Earth. Okay, distance to the center is what we're talking about. So, we good on that? So from now on, when we encounter a spherical object, we're going to use this result. Okay? Alright, so that takes us to circular orbits. Um, let's get into it. So, in general, when we're talking about orbits, okay, this can get pretty complicated. In general, you can have a bunch of different celestial objects, like, let's say, a bunch of different planets, a bunch of different stars, a bunch of different moons, that are all involved in some kind of orbit, right? We're going to stick to the simplest case, which is something called a two-body orbit. That just means there are two objects involved, just ignore everything else, all right? So we have a two-body orbit. So... What we're going to learn about, actually, in chapter 9, I'll show you why this result actually holds true, but for now I'm just going to give you the result. If you have a two-body orbit, it turns out both of those bodies are orbiting a common point, and that point is called the center of mass of the system. All right? And basically, the center of mass, if the two bodies are equal in terms of their mass, is exactly in the middle. So you see in this first case, we have two equal mass objects. The center of mass is right in the middle. So both of these bodies are going to orbit around that same exact point. Okay? In this case, one of the masses is a little bigger than the other, right? So the center of mass, you see that's the red cross right here, is going to now be closer to that bigger mass. Okay? And then if we increase the disparity between the masses even more, now that red cross is getting closer and closer to our bigger mass, right? So the more masses we make this guy, the more the center of mass kind of moves towards the middle of that larger guy, okay? So let's take a look at animations of each one of these orbits. See, in the first case, equal mass objects, they're both orbiting the midpoint, okay? But then if we look at this case over here, the center of mass is like almost right in the middle of this bigger mass, right? And so even though they are orbiting the same point, the bigger mass barely moves at all, right? And most of the motion is undergone by the smaller mass. Okay, so what's the point of this? If we have a two-body orbit where one of the masses is much, much bigger than the other, 
the one the way we write this is big M, the bigger mass, is much, much bigger than little m. We can treat it as if it's just the little mass orbiting the big mass, and the big mass is stationary, okay? But keep in mind that's not exactly true. In general, what's going on is they're both orbiting that common center of mass point, okay? Any questions on that? So we're going to be focusing on this case right here, basically, where you have one dominant mass and a smaller body, which we can treat as it's just going in a circle around that dominant mass, okay? By the way, the Earth going around the Sun is a great example of that. The Sun is so much more massive than the Earth that we can treat it just like that, okay? So let's do a review then, because we're talking about objects moving in a circle, in an orbit in this case. So let's do a review of circular motion. That stuff we learned in the last chapter is going to start to come into play here. So all of this is just a recap of what we've seen before, but I think it's useful to go over. Remember, if we have an object moving in a circular path at a constant speed, it has an acceleration. We call this acceleration the centripetal acceleration. And the reason for that is the acceleration goes inwards. Okay, it goes towards the center of the circle. And the magnitude of that acceleration is V squared divided by R. Okay, you've probably seen that equation a lot. You're probably sick of it, but we're going to still use it. Okay, the acceleration is V squared divided by R. So the picture you should have in your mind is this. We have a circular path. V, the velocity of the object, is going tangent to that path. Acceleration is going inwards. And then also remember, because net force equals mass times acceleration, if your acceleration is going inwards, guess what? So is your net force. So there's also some kind of force directed inwards. We can call that a centripetal force, okay? Centripetal just means going inwards, all right? So also recall that um, we don't really deal with our standard x, y coordinates anymore when we deal with circular motion. Instead, we refer to the radial direction, where the positive radial direction is something going out. Oh, sorry. <laughs> positive radial direction is something going in. Negative radial direction is something that's going out, right? Okay. So we say the net force in the radial direction is m times the acceleration in the radial direction. Remember, f equals ma, just apply it to whatever direction you want. But in this case, we set the acceleration equal to v squared divided by r. Okay? So hopefully, all that's looking familiar. Any questions so far? Okay, so we're going to do our first example of a circular orbit. So we're going to make some calculations about this particular circular orbit. The International Space Station, ISS, is in circular orbit around the Earth at an altitude of 408 kilometers. That means the International Space Station is 408 kilometers off of the ground, off the surface of the Earth. So it's actually not really that high up. Right? It's, it's in what we call low Earth orbit. All right? And the mass and the radius of the Earth I'll give you those right here. We need to know these numbers to do the calculation. The mass is 5.97, 10 to the 24 kilograms. Radius is 6,370 kilometers. Okay, so we're gonna do a few things. We're first gonna find the orbital speed of the ISS. And then on the next slide, I'll give you a follow-up question, okay? So we're gonna find the orbital speed. All right, let's get to that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw a picture, and any kind of circular orbit problem uh, should start with this type of picture, okay? So first, I'm going to draw the Earth, which is our spherical body. And in this problem, the Earth is by far the dominant mass compared to the space station. So the Earth is going to be labeled as capital M. Okay. Now, the orbit that's being undergone here is some distance away from the Earth, right? So I'll show the orbit itself with a dashed line like this. 
So this is the path that our satellite is taking as it goes around the Earth. Okay? Now let's label a few things. We were given an altitude or a height above the surface of 408 kilometers, right? That's basically going to be the distance between the surface of the Earth and my path. That's H right there. Okay? The radius of the Earth, I'm going to call that capital R. That's the distance between the center and the edge. Okay? Right. So if I look at the total distance between the center and where my orbit is, I'm going to call that lowercase r. That's just the notation, okay? So right away, hopefully, you can see how these distances relate to each other. What's the relationship? R plus h is uh, little r. Yeah, if I take, I want to find little r. That's the distance between the center of the Earth and where the orbit is. That's just the radius of the Earth plus the height above the surface of the Earth of my satellite, right? Make sense? And it's this, this radius that we actually care about, okay? Because remember, we have a spherical object, the force of gravity as if, is as if all of the mass were at the center, right? So it's the distance to the center we care about. And also, later on, when we do V squared over R, it's the radius of this path we care about, which is this radius, okay? It's not the radius of the Earth we care about, it's the total radius of this path that we care about, okay? So let's draw the other mass. That's going to be our space station. I'll label that as lowercase m. And it's moving in a circle, so its velocity vector is tangent to that circle. And it's feeling a force of gravity, which is attracting it to the center of the Earth, like this. So I'll, I'll label that as f sub g. Okay? This picture makes sense. All right, so let's do this calculation. By the way, we're doing the calculation of the distance of the satellite to Earth's center. And, okay, big R, that's the radius of the Earth in this uh, notation. So that's 6,370 kilometers, right? H is the height above the surface, which is 408 kilometers. If you add these together, you get 6,778 kilometers. And what I'm going to do next is convert kilometers to meters. So how do I do that? Yeah, it's going to be multiplying by a thousand. Here, remember how the unit conversion works. In every one kilometer, I have a thousand or ten to the three meters. All right? So, by the way, we're going to be using a lot of scientific notation going forward because we're going to be dealing with giant distances and giant masses. And it's just not going to be useful to write everything out in standard form. Okay? So, this in scientific notation is. 6.778, 10 to the 6 meters. And we'll keep three sig figs on that if you follow along. Okay? You good so far? All right. So the next thing we're going to do, now that we have a good picture of what's going on, is we're going to apply Newton's second law to the satellite. And, um, okay, well, Newton's second law, that's F equals MA. But in this case, we have circular motion, so we're doing this in the radial direction, okay? So the net force in the radial direction equals mass times acceleration in the radial direction. Okay, what forces are involved? What forces are acting on the satellite? The force of gravity. Force of gravity. Anything else? 
that should be it, right? If you just have an object out there above Earth's atmosphere, there's no air resistance acting on it, just grab it, okay? Uh, well, it turns out, yeah, there may be a little bit of air resistance because it's actually not that high up, but it's totally negligible, okay? So uh, here we have capital G, big M, little m, divided by little r squared for the force of gravity, okay? So I'm just saying the only force present is the force of gravity, and we know this is the equation for it, okay? This is the gravitational force between the two masses, all right? That's equal to the mass of our satellite, which is little m. Remember, I'm applying F equals ma to the satellite, so this should be the mass of the satellite on this side, which is the small m. And that uh, acceleration is v squared divided by r, okay? We're interested in finding the orbital speed, which is v. V is speed. So what can I do to find the speed? Well, one thing I can immediately do is cancel out the little m. So the big M stays here. The mass of the Earth definitely matters as far as how fast the orbit is going. But the mass of our satellite, which is little m, uh, drops out. So I get v squared equals g big M divided by r like this. Okay? And of course, what I want to do is find v. So if I square root v squared, I'll get v. Which means I want to square root gm over r. Okay? Okay, so now we're going to plug in some numbers. Does anyone remember the value of big G? 6.67. Yeah, 10 to the minus 11. And remember, the units are kind of funky here. It's uh, newtons, meters squared per kilogram squared. Okay, big M, that's where we plug in the mass of the Earth. Remember, big M stands in for the mass of the Earth. That's 5.97, 10 to the 24 kilograms. That's the mass of the Earth. Okay, we divide that by the radius. Remember, this is the radius to the center of the Earth, from where our satellite is to the center of the Earth, which we calculated over here, is 6.778, 10 to the 6 meters, and we'll square root that whole thing. Can someone crunch the numbers right here for me? Yeah, so, so I'm going to put it in scientific notation. 7.664, 10 to the 3, keep 3 sig figs. And what do we expect the units to be here? Meters per second? We probably expect meters per second, but looking at this, it's not obvious how it works out that way. So let's just go through the unit analysis real quick. Okay, what are we, what are we dealing with in this square root? Well, basically, uh, if I look at the units for G, that's newtons meters squared divided by kilograms squared. Then I've also got kilograms on top and meters on the bottom, and all of that is under the square root. So I'm just going to show you that this works out to meters per second. Okay. So one thing I can immediately do is cancel this unit of kilograms with one of the units on the bottom, so we just have kilograms on the bottom, and then this unit of meters with one of the units of meters on top. So now that we have uh, newtons, meters over kilograms under the square root, who uh, remembers what a newton is equivalent to? I think I heard kilograms, meters per second squared. Okay. 
because that's, um, of course, remember, force is mass times acceleration, so kilograms times meters per second squared. Okay, and then we've got meters over kilograms. Okay, it's going to simplify. Just watch. Kilograms drop out here and here. Now we have meters squared and seconds squared like this. Meters squared divided by seconds squared. And then uh, under the radical, works out some meters per second when we do the square root. Okay? Now, here's a trick that you should remember. Everything we plugged into to our formula had SI units. So SI units, meters per second, should come out. Uh, but you should also just be able to check like this. Okay? So the last thing I'll do is I'll say, oftentimes when we're dealing with really high speeds like this, we use the unit of kilometers per second. Okay? Because 10 to the 3 meters is the same as a kilometer, we can write this as 7.66 kilometers per second. So every second, the International Space Station is traveling a distance of 7.66 kilometers. It's moving incredibly fast, way faster than anything we see here on the surface of the Earth. Okay? So, any questions on that? All right, so make sure you have this number down, as well as this radius, because I'm going to ask you a follow-up. Okay, using that previous result, determine the orbital period of the ISS. Remember that period is the time it takes for a rotating object to complete one full revolution, right? So for this, give your answer in hours. Okay, how many hours does it take for the International Space Station to go all the way around the Earth? All right? So see what you get, and then we'll go through it together in a few minutes. Remember, if something's moving in a circle, the speed is 2 pi r divided by the period, right? So you know the speed, you know the radius, you can solve for the period. Get the answer in seconds. Okay, I see some people are starting to get this. A few of you have the answer already, I've seen. Um, anyone want to throw their answer out? 
What was that? 90 per meter? Uh, yeah, so, and then in hours, that's like one and a half hours, right? That's incredibly fast. I mean, just just think about that for a second, right? If, if you were to fly a plane all the way around the world, you know, how long would that take? Has anyone traveled to a very, very distant country on the other side of the earth? Like, how long are you flying for? How many? Something like that. And then double that to go all the way around the earth, right? This space station goes around the earth every 90 minutes, right? You could probably, you probably couldn't get to LA in 90 minutes during rush hour, right? So things are moving very quickly. Um, so here's the calculation we're doing, right? We're saying speed. The idea that we're using here is that speed is distance over time. So our orbital speed v is the distance we cover in one orbit, which is 2 pi r. That's the circumference of our orbit. And then the period is t, okay? We're solving for the period. So it's 2 pi r divided by v. The period we're looking for is this. We have 2 pi. Um, the radius, let's put it in kilometers, is... Uh, 6,778 kilometers, and for the speed, let's do that in kilometers per second, so that was 7.664 kilometers per second. So you see kilometers cancel, you just get seconds. So what's the, what's the answer in units of seconds? Five thousand five hundred and sixty-seven seconds. 5,000... 557 seconds. We want to get that into hours, so remember 60 seconds in one minute, cancel seconds. 60 minutes in one hour, cancel minutes. So we're basically dividing that by 60 twice, which gives us what? 1.54. 1.54. So it's about one and a half hours, okay? Now, as we're going to see, that period only applies to this satellite at this distance, okay? For a satellite that's in orbit at a much greater distance from the surface of the Earth, you'll have a much longer period, okay? But this is about as short as it gets, because you're almost grazing the surface of the Earth at this point, basically. So it's interesting, right? If you... If you're in that space station, you're going to see sunrises every one and a half hours as you're going around. Okay. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about an actual problem that we've been neglecting here, which is something called orbital decay. So, um, basically, Earth has an atmosphere. If something is moving through that atmosphere, you're going to have what's called air resistance or drag, which slows that motion down. Okay. Now we tend to think of where all the satellites are as perfectly empty space where there's no atmosphere at all, but it's not that simple really. Okay. The idea is earth's atmosphere gets thinner and thinner as you go up, but there's not really a point where it just stops. All right. So for satellites in low earth orbit, like the ISS, there is some atmosphere that it's moving through as it goes in its orbit, all right? It's a very thin atmosphere, so there's very little drag, there's very little air resistance, but it is there, and over time, the effects of that start to accumulate, okay? So it's probably not going to make a big difference for how the satellite moves over the course of like an hour or two, but over the course of many months and years, it starts to add up, okay? And so the, basically what's happening is the satellite is slowly slowing down, very gradually slowing down in its orbit, okay? Due to this slight drag force. And what that does is it causes our satellite to spiral inwards towards the Earth. This is what it looks like in an animation. So here's our satellite. It's experiencing a slight amount of drag. It's slowing down, and as it slows down, it moves a bit closer to the Earth. 
And you can imagine that if this were to just continue and you didn't fix this, that your satellite would just crash into the Earth at some point, okay? That's true. The ISS or the Hubble Space Telescope satellites that are in low Earth orbit, uh, these would crash into the Earth if we didn't do a little correction every once in a while to the orbit. So you have to give the satellite a little boost every once in a while, every few months, to keep it from crashing into the Earth, okay? By the way, if the satellite is really, really far out, you don't have to worry about this. This is just for the ones that are pretty close to the Earth. All right? Any questions on that? All right. So think of this as kind of a special case of a circular orbit, okay? What's going on here is nothing more than an object orbiting another body. Uh, in this case, we're thinking about orbiting the Earth because we want to have sort of a practical application for satellites we're putting in orbit around the Earth. But this is something we call a geostationary orbit, right? So basically, what is a geostationary orbit? You have a satellite that's moving around the equator of the Earth, and the period of that satellite exactly matches the rotation period of the Earth. So remember, the, the Earth's rotation period is how long it takes to spin on its axis. That's 24 hours. That's what defines the day, okay? So we're imagining the satellite also goes around the Earth once every 24 hours. So those exactly match. If you think about what that means for a second, it means the satellite is always above the same exact spot on the Earth at all times. Because it's spinning around the Earth just as fast as the Earth is spinning. So it's always going to be above the same exact point uh, above the Earth. So as far as we're concerned, we'd look up in the air and say, that satellite's not moving. It's just keeping a fixed position in the sky, right? Right, sometimes that's useful. Like if you want to just monitor a certain spot on the Earth, for whatever reason. All right, so T Earth has to equal T satellite for this to work. Same period. So let's calculate uh, something about this using an example here. What is the altitude? What is the height above the surface of a satellite that's in a geostationary orbit around the Earth? So this is kind of a different problem than what we did before. Here, we know what the period has to be. We're going to use that to calculate what the radius has to be. Okay? But other than that, it's pretty much the same setup as before. Make sense? So, so we, we know the period has to be 24 hours. Let's calculate what the radius must be for that to work out. Okay, so real quick, we know that because we're in a geostationary orbit, the period of our satellite, which we call T, that's 24 hours. So real quick, what we'll do is convert that to seconds, because we want SI units uh, in our calculations, okay? So we have 24 hours. Remember, in every one hour, we have 60 minutes. Cancel hours like this. Now we're in minutes. But remember, in every one minute, we have 60 seconds. So now we're in units of seconds. Can someone do that calculation? How many, basically I'm asking you, how many seconds are in a minute, right? It's 24 times 60 times 60. Yeah, 86,400. which in scientific notation, you want to get used to using this, is 8.64, 10 to what power? Fourth. Fourth power, seconds, okay? Okay, cool. Now, let's apply the second law, new the second law to the satellite. All right, um, this is gonna work just like before. We have a satellite in a circular orbit. We know how to deal with this. Let's just run through it real quick. We have the net force in the radial direction 
on our satellite equals the mass times the acceleration of our satellite in the radial direction. So what do we have? We'll assume the only force is gravity, which is totally reasonable in this case. You have big G, big M times little m divided by R squared. That's your force of gravity, okay? What does that equal? M V squared divided by R, because V squared over R is our acceleration, okay? So what do we do? Just like before, we cancel out the mass. And I can cancel out one of these R factors, right? So what we have is V squared equals GM divided by R. So here's what I want to do next. I don't know what V is, right? I'm trying to calculate R. I'm trying to calculate the distance that's needed, but I don't know V, so what can I do? I can sub that out. Remember, V is equal to 2 pi R divided by T, right? The speed at which our satellite moves is the circumference of the orbit divided by the period. Okay, so if I just put this in this equation, where I see v squared, then that'll accomplish what I want to accomplish. So I have 2 pi r, square that, uh, 2 pi r divided by t, square that whole thing, like this, equals big G, big M, divided by r. So just remember what we're doing, we're solving for r. That's the only unknown variable in that equation right there but we have to group things together so I can actually isolate R, okay? So just expand that out. If I have two squared, that's four. I'm squaring the pi factor, squaring the R factor, and I'm squaring the T factor like this. And the other side is the same as before. Now, I have an R on the bottom here. If I multiply on both sides by r, I get rid of this. But now I'm gonna have an r cubed on this side. I'm gonna have an r to the third power on this side. Now, to isolate that, I'm gonna to have to multiply by t squared, puts it over here, divide by four pi squared, puts that down here. So r cubed equals big G, big M, times t squared, divided by four pi squared. Okay, that's, that's how the math shakes out. Good so far? All we're doing is putting together the law of gravitation with some stuff about circular motion that we've seen before, okay? So I wanna solve for r. If I have r cubed, how do I undo that? I can take the cubed root, okay? It's not a square root, it's a cube root. Does, any, does anyone remember a different way to talk about a cube root? It's the same as raising to the one-third power. Square root is the same as raising to the one-half power. Cubed root, that's the one-third power. Okay, so if I'm trying to solve for r, I'm taking the cubed root on both sides, which is g big M t squared divided by four pi squared, all of that, take that to the one-third power, okay? That's what we're doing. Good so far? Okay. So now let's do the calculation. Our radius is, okay, I have 6.67, 10 to the minus 11. The units are newtons, meters squared per kilogram squared. The mass of the Earth, we've seen that before, that's 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Okay, now we have our T squared. I want this in the SI unit of seconds, so that's 8.64 times 10 to the four seconds, and we're squaring that. Then on the bottom we have four times pi squared. So that whole thing in brackets is taken to the one-third power. Okay? 
It's a lot to punch in the calculator, but that's what it is. And uh, here's what you get. So this is going to come out in meters. Everything we plugged in has SI units, so the resulting R distance is going to have meters as the unit. So we have 4.223, 10 to the 7 meters. You can verify that. Okay? But let's be careful. What I just found there, that's the distance between your satellite and the center of the Earth. Okay? That's distance to the center of the Earth. It's not what we want, okay? We want the distance above the surface of the Earth. So remember how this goes? From the work we did in the last problem, right? The height above the surface plus the radius of the Earth equals your distance to the center, right? In other words, little r, which is what we just found, is big R, the radius of the Earth, plus your height above the surface, H. So H is little r to, uh, minus big R, like this. Okay? So, let's put in what we know. Um, we have little r, which is 4.223, 10 to the 7 meters. And then this is the radius of the Earth, which is 6.37, 10 to the 6 meters. That's the radius. We've seen that before, okay? Okay, you crunch these numbers. Here's what you get. Um, you get 3.586, 10 to the 7 meters. Or if you want to express this in kilometers, that would be 3. Point, well, let's round it to 3.59 because we have three sick figs here, 10 to the 4 kilometers. Okay, so about 35,900 kilometers, okay? If you put that in miles, that's like 22,000 miles. So that's a very distant orbit compared to, let's say, the ISS, which is only a couple hundred kilometers up, right? And that's why it has a much longer period. Okay, any questions on how we did this? All right, so basically, um, you should be able to take any period and calculate what the distance for that orbit would be given a certain period, right? This is what we did. All right, then. so let's keep it moving. Um, oh yeah, by the way, I didn't show you this animation. This, this is a cool animation that explains what I was saying earlier, right? Our satellite matches the rotation period of the Earth, so it's always above the same spot on the Earth. Okay? So that's how far away it is. We just found it. Alright, cool. Um, I'm going to show you a few other things here. Um, first is, how do we know what the Earth's mass is? I mean, really think about that, right? You can't put it on a scale. Uh, you're going to have to use some other means of figuring out what the mass is. Basically, uh, we can figure out the mass is using information we already know about how the moon orbits the Earth. And we could really use any satellite for this if we know exactly with what distance and what period something orbits the Earth. We can figure out the mass of the Earth based on that. Okay? So, uh, for this calculation, we're going to use the moon. Okay, we're going to use information about the moon's orbit. Remember how I was saying when we deal with two-body orbits, we consider one mass to be the dominant one? Well, that's going to be the Earth. The Earth is considerably more massive than the moon. So that's going to be our big M. And our little m is going to be the moon. So we're just going to treat it as if the Earth stays stationary and the moon is just going around the Earth like this. Okay? All right. Here are some things we know. I've actually shown you this before. We know the distance to the moon. Uh, it's about uh, 240,000 miles, which in meters is 3.8 10 to the 8 meters. That's the distance between the center of the Earth and the moon, to be precise. The period is about 27 days. It's about a month, uh, which is 2.4 10 to the 6 seconds. That's how long a lunar cycle is for the moon to go around. 
Okay, so that's the information we need. I'll show you how we'll get the result from there. Um, so again, we're going to start with Newton's second law, F equals ma. We have only one force acting on the moon, which is the force of Earth's gravity in this picture. And that force, remember, is big G, big M, little m, divided by r squared. That's the force of gravity between the Earth and the moon. That equals mass times acceleration. So we take the mass of the moon, which is our little m in this case, times v squared over r, which is our acceleration. Okay? Which gives us, if we solve for big M, because that's what we're trying to do, we're trying to calculate Earth's mass in this example, big M, that's going to be r v squared divided by g. So just take this, solve for big M, and you'll get this result. Okay? Good so far? Okay, so it looks like all we need to plug in is V, because the other numbers are known to us. So we'll need the moon's orbital speed, that's V. Let's calculate it, that's, well, it's just distance over time, right? So it's two pi r is your distance divided by the period, which is T, okay? This keeps coming up, right? Um, well, we plug in our distance of r, that's 2 pi, 3.8, 10 to the 8 meters. We plug in our time, which is 2.4, 10 to the 6 seconds. And we get like nearly 1,000 meters per second, 995 meters per second, given these numbers, okay? So you can verify that, that's what it comes out to. So I'm going to take this v. And I'm going to plug it in right there. What's that going to give me? It's going to give me, again, the mass of the Earth. All right. So remember, mass is r v squared divided by g. Plug in all the numbers we know. r, remember that's 3.8 10 to the 8 meters, distance to the moon. v, 995 meters per second. We're squaring that. And then we're dividing 6.67, 10 to the minus 11, that's big G. Did someone do this for me right, right here? Did this come out? Five, six, four, 10 to the 24. Yeah, so Rough estimate, it's about 6, 10 to the 24 kilograms, okay? We determine that solely based on how the moon moves around the Earth, okay? So that's how we know the mass of the Earth, It's because we know exactly how different satellites orbit around it. Guess what? You can use this technique for any object, right? So in the next example, we're going to calculate the mass of the sun based on how the Earth orbits the sun, okay? And remember, this is pretty close to the value I've given you in the past, right? So here's our example. We're going to take the Earth in its orbit around the sun. Here are some facts about the way the Earth orbits around the sun. First of all, the distance. The average distance is 93 million miles. You may have seen this number before, 93 million miles. The thing about the Earth orbiting the sun, it's not a perfect circle. It's actually an elliptical orbit. The shape of its orbit is an ellipse. But it's pretty close to a circle, and on average, that's the, the radius of the circle. Okay? Cool. What about the period? Well, that's, that's a year. That's 365 days. Okay? So if we just follow the same logic that we just used for that previous example to get the mass of the Earth, we can use these numbers to get the mass of the sun, okay? Remember, Earth, it's, it's like order of magnitude 10 to the 24 kilograms. The sun, much, much more massive, okay? That's what we're going to see here. All right, so we're going to start by calculating the period of Earth's orbit. Uh, 
um, which is, you know, 365 days. By the way, this is not exact. It's actually like 365 and a quarter days. That's, that's why we have leap years. Um, but we're not being super precise. Let's just say 365. Okay. Uh, and let's convert that to seconds because we're going to need to know the period in seconds for the next part of our calculation. Okay, so here it is, uh, 365 days, um, and every day we have 24 hours. That's a lot of days. Okay, and every hour we have 60 minutes, cancel out hours, and every minute we have 60 seconds, cancel out minutes, we're left with seconds. So this, this basically is how many seconds are in a year, okay? It's a lot of seconds. Anyone have the answer? Let's do it in scientific notation. The numbers are getting kind of big. Yep, 3.15. I'm going to give an extra digit here, which is 4. If you just go to the next digit, I think. Uh, 10 to the 7 seconds. So it's like 30, 30 million ish seconds, okay, in a year. That's what you get for each year. Okay, so now let's do the orbital speed of Earth around the sun. Um, so basically, we're going to use V equals 2 pi r divided by t. That's the same as before, right? Where the radius, by the way, um, we said that's 93 million miles. That's the same as about 150 million kilometers. Okay? Okay. Does anyone know um, million? Like, that's 10 to what power? 10 to the 6. So I could write this as 150 times 10 to the 6. And then kilo, that's 10 to the 3 meters, right? So 10 to the 6 covers the million part. 10 to the 3 covers the kilo part. So we have 150 times 10 to the 6 times 10 to the 3 meters. If you just put that in a more compact way, that's 1.5, 10 to the 11 meters. Okay? So what is that? It's like 150 billion meters is the distance from the Earth to the sun. Okay? Very long distance. Right, so we can use that to calculate V. V is 2 pi times that distance of 1.5, 10 to the 11 meters, divided by this period of 3.154, 10 to the 7 seconds. So this is how fast the Earth moves around the sun in units of meters per second as it's going in its orbit. Can someone tell me what that V works out to? Two point nine nine ten to the four. That's meters per second, right? That's incredibly fast. That's like uh, about thirty uh, kilometers per second. Uh, that's how fast the Earth is going around the sun. Okay. So, all right. Last thing. Apply the second law to Earth. All right, let's do that. You've seen this before, so I'll run through it real quick. 
Kind of works the same way every time that we have a simple orbit, okay? We say the net force in the radial direction is m times the acceleration in the radial direction, okay? The force in question, if it's a simple two-body orbit, is just gravity, which is given by big G, big M, little m, divided by r squared. Now, in this case, our big M is the mass of the sun. Our little m is the mass of the earth. So the sun completely dominates the earth in terms of mass. So we can treat it as if the earth is just going around the sun and the sun is stationary, okay? So on the other side of the equation, we have little m, which is now the mass of the earth, v squared divided by r. So we'll cancel out the little m and we'll solve for the big M. And this is just like before. Remember, we got V squared times R divided by G. So if you just solve for big M, this is what you get. And now we're ready to plug in the numbers. So here we have V squared is 2.99, 10 to the 4 meters per second. Square that whole thing. R is 1.5, 10 to the 11 meters. And then G is 6.67, 10 to the minus 11 newtons meters squared per kilogram squared. Again, just convert everything to SI units before plugging the numbers in. It's going to save you a lot of trouble. That's what we did here. What do we get based on this calculation for the mass of the sun? times 10 to the 30th? 2.0 times 10 to the 30th power kilograms. Now remember, Earth is on the order of 10 to the 24. So this is six orders of magnitude, about a million times uh, more massive than the Earth. Okay? But that's one way that we know the sun's mass. It's just a calculation like this. By the way, you can apply this to any planet going around the sun, and you end up with the same number. Okay? Any questions on this? Okay, so we're going to keep going with a few other things here today. Uh, in particular, I wanted to talk about gravity near Earth's surface. Okay, I want to kind of bring together two different ideas that we've been dealing with and that have been floating around. One is this law of universal gravitation. That's G M1 M2 divided by R squared giving you a force, right? But we also know that as far as staying near Earth's surface is concerned, uh, the force of gravity is more or less constant, and it's just given by M times G, where G is 9.8 meters per second squared, right? So these two ideas actually do fit together, and I'm going to show you how that works uh, in this next part, okay? So now, we're not talking about orbiting bodies anymore. We're just talking about objects basically in free fall near the surface of the Earth, right? So if I drop a pen, it's in free fall as it goes to the table. Um, how can we analyze that situation using what we know now? Okay. So what I'm going to show you here is a formula for calculating lowercase g for a spherical body. Okay, remember, this is a different number from uppercase g. Uppercase g is the number that appears in the law of gravitation. Lowercase g is what we call the free fall acceleration. Okay, it's the acceleration of an object that's in free fall near the surface of some I'll call it celestial body. This could be the Earth, this could be the Moon. We want to be general, right? Just some kind of celestial body, all right? Uh, of course, on Earth, we expect 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay, so here's the general picture. You have your big M, 
That's your celestial object. That's planet, moon, whatever you want. And then you have your object in free fall near the surface of that object. That's your little m, okay? So if you like, you can picture big M is the Earth and little m is the pen that I just dropped, okay? That'll work. Um, okay, the radius of this big object is what we're gonna call capital R, all right? So those are the numbers that are going into this. So what we'll do is we'll apply Newton's second law to this object, which is F equals MA. But we gotta be careful, right? This whole time we've been putting V squared over R in for the acceleration. We're not doing that here because we're not talking about a circular orbit, right? We're just talking about falling to the surface of the body. And um, yeah. Uh, let's also keep in mind uh, that if we're staying very close to the surface, that our distance between the center of our object and our falling body is basically the radius of, the, uh, of that body. For example, right, like if I put this uh, pointer right on the ground, how far is it from the center of the Earth? It's one radius away, right? If I lift it up a few meters, I mean, that makes practically no difference, right? It's still basically the same distance away from the center because the radius is so huge compared to just the meter or so distance I lifted it up, right? So as long as we're staying pretty close to the surface, the distance to the center is just the radius of that object, okay? So that means for the net force side of the equation, we have big G, big M, little m, divided by big R squared, the radius of this body squared. On the other side of the equation, I'm going to write this as mg, because remember, g is just a special type of acceleration. It's just the acceleration that you experience when you're in free fall. So I'm just going to label the acceleration as g, because we're talking about a situation where you're in free fall. I'm trying to solve for g, so I can get there really quickly by canceling out little m. I can cancel out the mass of my free falling body. What does that give us? Little g equals big G times big M divided by r squared. So, in other words, you have a spherical body, like a planet. You just need to know the mass and the radius of that body, and you know the free fall acceleration. So, if we plug in the mass of the Earth and the radius of the Earth right here, what should we get? What should this come out to? If I plug in the mass and the radius of the Earth. We expect that should come out to 9.8 meters per second squared. Let's verify that that's what happens, okay? So this is our formula. Uh, big G times big M divided by R squared is little g, your free fall acceleration. What numbers are going into this? Earth has a radius. I'm going to round things to two digits, so we have 6.4, 10 to the 6 meters. You could be more precise than that if you wanted. The mass is about 6.0, 10 to the 24 kilograms. And then our constant, big G, 6.67, 10 to the minus 11. Those numbers are going in. And here we have it. We have little g is 6.67, 10 to the minus 11. Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. Big M, 6, 10 to the 24 kilograms. And then R, 6, 10 to the 6 meters. Square that value. All right, just for fun, punch it into your calculators. See what you get. Oh, you know what? Um, I'm sorry, I have a typo. The radius, which goes down here, is 6.4 10 to the 6. So just make sure 6.4 10 to the 6 is what you plug in on the bottom.
Did you get 9.8? You should. Did you get 9.8? And real quick, let's go through the units, okay? Um, all right, do you see how on top I have meters squared and on the bottom I also have meters squared? Those cancel. Up here I have kilograms, down here I have kilograms squared. What are we left with after cancellation? Newtons divided by kilograms. But remember a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. And that allows you to cancel the kilograms right there. And then you just get meters per second squared, that's 9.8, okay? Uh, so 9.8 meters per second squared, that's where it comes from, okay? Just depends on how massive the earth is and how big it is in terms of radius. And this also explains, by the way, why if you go to a different planet, the strength of gravity, which we characterize with this number little g, has a different value, okay? Let's just look at this table real quick to see some of the common values. Um, so we've got Earth. If we were to go to the moon, we would have 1.62 meters per second squared for our free fall acceleration. Has anyone ever seen uh, the video from one of the moon landings? Astronauts walking around on the surface of the moon, right? I mean, they can jump just incredibly high, right? They drop something, it looks like it's falling in slow motion, right? That's why gravity is much weaker. If you're on Mars, about 3.77. Other places have stronger gravity than it, like Jupiter. Jupiter is a gas planet, you can't stand on it. But right at the surface, this is the strength of its gravity. It's like 26 meters per second squared, okay? Um, so here, let's do this. You have the relevant formula, okay? Little g is big G times big M divided by R squared. What I want you to do is this. Using this data, planet Mars has a mass 6.39, 10 to the 23 kilograms. Its radius is 3,390 kilometers. Estimate the value of G at the surface of Mars using these two data points, okay? And then try this. Try estimating the value if you're not at the surface of Mars, but instead you're 1,750 kilometers above the surface of Mars, okay? We're kind of running out on time. So how about you just do the first part? Take a few minutes to do that, and then we'll go through both parts together, okay? So for this calculation, just jump right to the result with the right for little g. Okay, so time, time is getting away from us. Uh, let's just go through this and then we'll end class. Um, all right, so here we go. Um, so free fall acceleration on a, on a spherical body is given by big G, big M divided by R squared. So we're gonna do this calculation as it applies uh, at the surface of Mars. So here's what we come up with. 
6.67, 10 to the minus 11. Newton's meters squared per kilogram squared is big G. The mass of Mars, which is 6.39, 10 to the 23 kilograms. It's about 10 times less massive than Earth, by the way. Um, divide by R squared. Uh, where R is the radius, so that's uh, 3,390 kilometers, but in meters, we would multiply that by 10 to the 3, okay? And then we'll square the whole thing. What does this come out to? Yeah, it's about 3.71 meters per second squared, okay? So significantly weaker gravity. And it's going to get even weaker if we go not on the surface, but at 1,750 kilometers above the surface. So essentially what this is doing is increasing our radius by this amount, okay? So we have 6.67, 10 to the minus 11 newtons meters squared per kilogram squared times 6.39, 10 to the 23 kilograms. And then we'll divide by this. So if you're at this height above the surface, now your total radius is 3,390 plus 1,750, that's kilometers. So we'll take that times 10 to the three, now it's in meters, and then we're gonna, we're gonna square that whole thing, okay? Uh, what does this come out to? One point six one. That's right. Meters per second squared. So that's of course illustrating the uh, fact that we already know, which is that as you get further away from a body its gravity falls off, it decreases, okay? So that's it for today.